Hello everyone, how's it going? My name's Ben, aka Captain Ben, aboard the Bonnie Rackham, a Black Sails podcast. Yes, I have decided to name it after my favourite ship. Get it? (laughs) I thought it would be a cool little name, it's, you know, tied in and, yeah, it pretty much does what it says on the tin. So yeah, this is a deep dive into all things Black Sails. Thank you for the people that did find the first one, you know, stuck a little like and and put a little comment in that. Thank you, I appreciate that, it means a lot. So yeah, there's not going to be many of us, but I'm just going to do it, I'm going to crack on and whoever finds it and watches it, it may, it may build up a bit of steam over time, it may not, it may end up, it's just the same three or four of us kind of cracking on, you know, in the next four months when it all finishes sort of thing. But hey, I'm just going to have a good time doing it. I think without further ado... I'm pretty much just ready to crack straight into episode two. First item. Okay, so our first item of business is giving this a title. So obviously last episode I decided to call a man named Vasquez. This one was easy to name, I feel. Just really easy. I've decided to call this one Wrecked. Because yes, a relationship is wrecked. Plans are wrecked. And a lot of the action takes place in an area on the island called the Rex. So, yeah, Rex is just a natural kind of obvious title for this one. So let's get into Rex. item! Okay, so this one is written by Jonathan Steinberg and Robert Levine. I think that's the same names again. And this one is directed by Sam Miller, which I... No, the first one was directed by Neil Marshall. So, yeah, we've got, you know, another director already. So that's worth making a note of. So our first scene, yeah, it's the morning after the night before. We have Eleanor and Max. Eleanor and Max, you know, they've spent the night together. And Eleanor wakes, you know, and she goes... Oh, yeah, by the way, I say I say the phrase, you know a lot. I, I worked this out when I was editing and I had to edit out about maybe a hundred of them. <laughs> I cut them down, but it was still very, you know, you know, it's just a little filler thing I do to give me a couple of seconds to think of what I can need to say next. And it's just, it's something I unfortunately cannot stop. I will try and cut out as many as them as I possibly can, you know, where it, there I've gone again. See, I'm super aware of it now, so I'm going to try and be better, but it, it is just something that comes out of my mouth just to give my brain that does go a little bit slower than your average person a little bit longer to think of what I want to say next. So, yeah, you will hear me say you know a little bit more than the average person, but it's my kind of uh filler kind of noise, if that makes sense. Okay, get that out of the way first. <laughs> right, yeah, so so Eleanor wakes, you know... So, so Eleanor wakes and Max is in the bed, you know, they're in Max's apartment room whatever you want to call it and she looks out the window you know we get a lovely beautiful shot of Nassau and a beautiful shot of Max. Eleanor has a moan about her father and tells Max a man of war the Royal Navy has been spotted. Wonders if today's the day the British are back and Nassau's time is up and we get a little bit all about that and her fears about that. Something that's just always in the back of her mind and we learn her father's not been on the island for at least five years. He leaves it all to her. She's she's doing everything here on this island, so she's got her work cut out for her. Obviously, in all this, Eleanor's basically kind of... I don't know if it's necessarily foreshadowing, but all her fears she's talking about, like the English coming, taking over, and, and kind of civilised men running it, and her losing her place and stuff, it's all kind of a bit of foreshadowing, really, what will happen when she sort of marries the wrong guy maybe so yeah that that's interesting i don't know if they necessarily had that in mind when they wrote this but it's interesting anyway and a little bit sad because she does not want it at all here and she fears it but she almost expects it in a way yeah this is basically eleanor's civilization is coming speech pretty much you know that um flint got in the last episode this is kind of her her fear in it so that will be important for a scene in a little bit so yeah, we get a quick little scene next um, at Vane's camp. He's just sat kind of cross-legged at the beach just watching the wal- walrus. He's just waiting for it all to go wrong for Flint. He wants to be the first thing that Flint sees when he comes ashore. So yeah, that's a that's sort of setting up the kind of... Vane's 
in a good mood at this point in the episode. That will not last. <laughs> My God. So now, we, yeah, we, we come to the walrus. Flint's hyped him up. They're all kind of... They're, they're spending their money already, pretty much. But Billy's in his feelings. He's still very shocked at, at himself. He's feeling the burden of what he did and lying about the page. He shows Gates. He shows him, look, there's nothing on this page. Nothing. What did I do, he says. You know, Silver's doing his usual. He's just watching, kind of taking everything in. Getting a feel. Maybe knowing he's got to be a bit careful now because he's going to start being suspected. We get a small little Randall moment. It's still not quite the conversa- ready for the conversation I want to have about Randall. But it is like where he sort of knows exactly what's going on. And he's, you know, a little bit smarter than he makes out to be. He's not saying it to Silver, but Silver's right next to him. He's kind of just looking into the distance. But he's like, we don't like thieves. You shouldn't steal. That's what happens. And it kind of pauses for a minute and Silver's like, who's he talking to? And then we see the shot of um, Singleton dead and some of the crew are mocking him and things like that. It's the argument of is Randall as stupid as he seems or is he actually smarter and he's just playing a game? I like to think that he is playing and he was planning something, but I don't know, his his vein cut his plan short. But yeah, that's an interesting little moment anyway. Yeah, so Singleton's dead body is shown, and we see two of Singleton's men still left over and were loyal to him. They're not happy with how things are going. One of them you know, wants to go straight in and and stop the mocking and stuff, but the other one, a little bit smarter, he's basically like, look, that this is not the time right now. This Don't be stupid. Let's wait. And that's kind of left to stew, and we don't come back to that this episode. Flint tells Gates and Billy, so this is in Flint's cabin now, he tells them that someone on deck is a thief. It's quickly deducted that it's Silver. They come out and Silver realises, oh, time's up. So he's trying to make a hasty escape. He's kind of inquiring, I don't know, about the next boat he can get off or something like that. And, and you know, and maybe the guy thinks he just wants to get laid. So, you know, there's a little joke around that. But desperately, he just jumps off ship and belly, belly flop right into the water. Looks painful as hell. Yeah, it's not Silver's smoothest moment. And the guy, you know, there's a fun little moment with a guy and he's just like, he must really want to get laid. <laughs> so, yeah, so right. So now, after a little bit of afters uh, with Max and Eleanor, she finally comes down and shows herself. You know, Scott's not very impressed. I think he wanted to get to business and Eleanor was getting to her own business. Da, da, da. She gives Miss Mapleton... She's obviously the madame of the establishment. She gives us some money for Max. And it's, yeah, it's important to note at this point, the brothel is very run down. It's very, you know, it's shoddy. Mrs. Uh, Mapleton is seeing to one of the girls who's just looking all, you know, I think she's being bruised up. And it's very like, oh, just firm it. You know, she's not like offering any support. It's looking, you know, it's, Max hasn't got her touch on it yet, which we shall say. Yeah, and we sort of learn a little bit more about Mr. Scott in the episode, and yeah, I'll get more into Mr. Scott in a bit, because I do have a few niggles about Mr. Scott. Yeah, we'll get into it. Um, But yeah, he doesn't, we love him, he doesn't really have the faith and respect in the pirates as Eleanor does. He says, you can never forget who these men are. These are not our friends. They want they, they want your father's business. That is the only reason we do not find their knives at our throats. And he warns Eleanor about acting rash with Vane last night. You know, it's it's not a good idea. Um, and we see they have a good relationship. But she's listening. Well, I say she's listening to him. She, she's letting him speak, <laughs> shall we say. And he's making good points. And if we didn't know what we know about Mr. Scott from season three, you know, about the Maroons and this whole other life he's got, then this flows fine and there's no kind of complaints about it but a lot came up in this episode and it will again in a couple of episodes where Mr. Scott I think is one of the only plot lines where they didn't make it up as they went along but it doesn't quite hold like hold out all the way through if that makes sense like you can go back to it and like oh I don't think they were planning here for him to be like this have this whole double operation thing going I don't think that was the plan here because what he's saying, but what he's doing, it it just doesn't correlate. So 
yeah, it's a it's a minor moan, but you again you just you don't even notice it on a first watch. You're just like, oh yeah, he's like her advisor. He's a kind of like a he's a bit of a Jiminy Cricket, isn't he? He's kind of on her shoulder, like, and he's got good advice most of the time. It's only when you kind of think about season three that some of his stuff it kind of doesn't quite make sense. And I and I do I think this was the only kind of storyline where they hadn't. Or if even if it wasn't the only storyline, it's the only one that you can kind of pull apart a little bit and be like, eh, I'm not sure. But yeah, it's it's a minor moan. Again, it's not like this big massive plot hole, but it's something. So yeah, now we are back at Vane's camp, and Jack is he's weighing out five thousand pesos in pearls. Jack says it's an investment. Vane and Anne enter the tent, and he tells Vane about the Urca de Lima. He tells him that a third party, obviously Max, has offered to sell the schedule to him. And, you know, he goes into detail about what this will mean and that it's good business and and all that sort of thing. And Vane straight away, he's not, he's like, he thinks it's a swindle, he's not convinced and he, he thinks it's too good to be true. And it's clear, Jack kind of states it, that it's clear and it's made clear to us that things have been a bit frosty between Vane and Eleanor for a while. The crew, the Ranger crew, haven't been getting any good leads from her. They're on their arse a little bit. Yeah, we see Vane's not doing great. The crew, at least, are not doing great at the moment. And Vane is going to have a little bit of a bad run, isn't he, these next few episodes? This is still very much Vane v Flint at this point in time, you know. They're kind of building Matt up. And he, he sort of like, yeah, all right, do what you've got to do. He kind of just shrugs Jack off a little bit. And he says to Anne to find him when Singleton's back and it's done. As soon as he's out, Anne's just like, fuck's his problem. <laughs> Woman of little words. And Jack says he thought Flint was the only one standing in the way of him being crowned king. He fought wrong. And then we get a little scene. So yeah, Silver's done his run. He's jumped off the ship and there was a little boat uh, skiff. I've got to find out what they're called. I'm going to call it a skiff, but I could be wrong. And once he's on shore, he's very clever. Obviously, there's a lot of little market businesses about. He runs to a couple of different people. Where's the blacksmith? Where's the brothel? Whatever he says. And then when Gates and Flint and Billy arrive at shore a little while later, and they're like, where did this guy go? They're all like, so he's got he's got himself a little time. And yeah, and another just little thing to note, I love that Gates uses the word twat. <laughs> such, such an English word, and... Totally probably wouldn't have been used at that time. Probably wasn't even a thing, but I, I like I like they included it. It's one of my favourite cuss words. <laughs> so yeah, we get a fun little scene now. So he's he's done his run, done his runner silver, and he's get bought himself a bit of time and he makes it to the brothel and he interrupts Max, who has a punter. So Max is giving a hand job to this guy, you know, it's kind of funny the way they shoot it. You can't, obviously, you can't see anything. You just sort of see a hand go in and he wants a bit more than a hand job. He wants the full deal. And we sort of find out that Eleanor is basically paying, paying for the privilege of Max just to do basics kind of stuff. No, all the ways. But he barges in and he just, he's not having it. And they're both like, outside. The disgruntled punter leaves and Silver tells Max Flint is on to him. And Max panics a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I'll get a bit more into Max when we come to it. Yeah, my slight confusion with, with her this episode. But um, anyway, we'll get on to that in a minute. Yeah, and Silver says once he's paid, they can leave tonight for Port Royal. And she sort of hesitates and he sort of says, what's what's left for you here? What's keeping you on this island? OK, so now we're we're back and yeah, Eleanor and Mr. Scott, they're doing a bit of business on the beachfront. And this is unfortunately would probably be something regularly they have to deal with. Just this really unpleasant, just asshole. James Bridge of the Demeter. Um, yeah, absolute knob jockey. We learn a little bit more about how all the how Eleanor and her business works. The more pirates regularly trade with her, the the better their shares they get, and the more tips they get, they'll get that sort of thing. You know, it's kind of a working relationship that builds itself up. So obviously, we can yeah deter from that because things haven't been great with her in vain. That's why it's gone the other way. So yeah, this guy's giving it the big I am, saying he'll take his business elsewhere and all the rest of it. And um, Vane appears and he gives, you know, he name drops himself and the ranger. And this guy's like, 
So, we're trading, are we? We're doing some business. He's politer to Mr. Scott, who he, he, he was awful to. Business is concluded and Vane does her a little favour. You know, I think he's trying to not win her back, but win her favour back at least. And that kind of continues into the next scene, where they, they're in her office now. And Vane, you know, he's gently at first, he gently confronts her that his crew haven't been getting any tips of late. He says, things are better for the both of us when you and I are on the same side of things. <laughs> and that is very true, because when they are not, it is messy. She said she stopped providing intelligence because of the way he runs his ship. His men are unruly, they're out of control, and because of that, he is a poor investment. Vane's not convinced, and yeah, he's, he can, he's convinced it's not personal, and win maybe at first not knowing enough about Eleanor but now with hindsight it's personal and it's deliberate isn't it a little bit he, he, things get a bit heated you know he gets a bit worked up over her loyalty to Flint there's a bit of back and forth between them and it's confirmed if we didn't already gather it from the first episode that they used to hook up but Eleanor is staying firm with her decision and before any more is said there's a bit of a commotion and Flint has returned so they greet and Vane is, you know, he's still about, he's in the doorway, he's kind of watching and he is pissed off. You know, he overhears that Singleton was unsuccessful, they meet eyes and yeah, Vane from here on out, I mean he'll have a little bit of a boost in the next episode as a boost, but yeah, he's going to have a bit of a rough three or four episodes now. Yeah, he, he is pissed off, he's going to be a miserable git now for the rest of the episode. Then we get the famous, the very famous, and the very loved fruit, fruit, tets, tets, <laughs> little scene with Captain Naff, I believe his name is, isn't it? Yeah, he's comparing art, and Billy and Gates are sat above watching all this. Gates is, he's very amused, he's highly amused, but Billy, Billy's still stressed, bless him. He's still stressed with, with what he's done, and his world is kind of shifted a little bit, this last episode for him. So Gates, you know, he sits Billy down, and he, he sort of says to him, this is a really good, a really nice kind of father-son, Billy and Gates scene, one of the, one of the big kind of first ones where we really see there's a lot of respect and love there and he says Billy did that you did the right thing Billy says he lied to his own crew to protect his captain and Gates counters and says he lied to protect the crew as he knows the Scarborough is coming and so bigger fish to flock to fry is basically what Gates is kind of saying Billy tells him about what Flint said about needing a king he does it expecting maybe a bit of a more of reaction from Gates and Gates Gates agrees that they need something. This is again just confirming that Gates is a really great quartermaster. Flint and he has a lot more faith than I think most do and most would at this point. But he's talking sense and he's he's making it all seem very reasonable. And I think he calms Billy down a little bit, which is the main thing. He's, he just doesn't seem to be stressing about anything too much at the minute, Gates. So they're up there and they spot the appraiser on the move. And they follow him uh, through the market. Okay, and it's a really decent kind of tracking, kind of long shot following them. And we get a decent shot kind of through the washing line. And yeah, I really like that kind of shot from the episode. And yeah, and Gates just somehow works out that he's going to be using pearls for currency. Because it's just easier to manage or something like that. It, yeah, it's another one of those, maybe he's worked that all out a little bit too easily. But... I mean, he's a smart man, isn't he? And he knows business, so I said, you know, it's probably not that deep. And and Bonnie gets name dropped for the for the first time. If you didn't know who she was, you'd find out who she was because she's watching the door while they they're inside doing the business. So now we're inside, and we've got Silver kind of peeping for a peephole in the next room with Adele. We're, yeah, we're going to meet Adele for the first time. I love Adele. I think Adele is a great little side character. She's obviously going to have more to do as the series goes on. She's not impressed. She's got nothing to do. She's kind of just sat there like, do you, do you not want me to do anything? And he's just like, no, nope, no, nope, just sit there. And she's like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, and yeah, and the pearls are confirmed as legit. So now we're back with Flint and Eleanor. He kind of fills her in, you know, all about what happened with her father, that he's injured and that he's technically kind of a fugitive now. But Eleanor kind of confirms that Mr. Guffrey has been bribing the officials for years, bribing them to kind of turn a blind eye to what he's doing. So one of them, obviously, this Mr. Hume, is obviously being a bit of a job's worth or he's either not aware or going back on a deal or something. Yeah, it's pretty much agreed that Mr. Guffrey would have been made governor, but... 
Yeah, and as Flint says, yeah, it would appear they've had a change of heart. He admits he never liked her father. Same. And obviously, yeah, Mr. Scott's in the room as well. And he says, once the news breaks of all this, that they're finished, no other, no port will have them or do business with them because they won't be seen as reputable anymore. Maybe this is one of those where you can get away with it and be like, oh, it does make sense because, yeah, maybe he's a bit worried about himself and, and how he's going to do business if Eleanor Guthrie's trading ceases to exist. But again, that kind of counters with what he was saying earlier about the pirates when he kind of needs that business. He kind of needs Eleanor to keep doing what she's doing, really. So, yeah, you know, a bit of bit of back and forth with him. But um, the scene ends with Flint beginning his story of a man of a Spaniard named Vasquez. So, yeah, now Max and Jack are talking the exchange. Yeah, they're just going over the details. I think the Rex at sundown is decided where it will take place. Vane bursts in. He just bursts in. Vane has obviously been listening to the crew. Flint's crew are obviously about having drinks or whatever. And he's heard the gossip and he's heard the wrong gossip. He's heard that Flint has the page. He's like, she doesn't have the page. Flint does. She is playing us for a fool. This is a swindle. And yeah, he t- he takes it all out on Max. This is, this is you know, where I'm like, oh, Vane, you're going down a few notches in my book. You're going down a few notches, mate. Because, yeah, he, you know, he manhandles her. He's, yeah, I get it, he's pissed off. He is absolutely, I think he's letting his emotions run with him here and he's not thinking smart. But Max, you know, she stands strong. She's not, like, screaming or she's kind of just firming it a little bit. Jack kind of works it out what's happened. But he's coming across very smart already. Yeah, it's another one of those... Oh, he came to that very quickly. He came to that realisation and that conclusion very quickly. Is it kind of a convenient plot thing, you know, that they just did, like... Because they've got a couple of them in these first few episodes. Or at the same time, it could just be Jack pulling absolutely anything out of his ass to try and kind of calm the situation down so yeah it, it could be either with knowing jack i think he probably could have worked it out of what's going on because i think he be- he believes in max and that she's legit so yeah he's just trying to calm all that situation down and he sees max kind of do because i think max can maybe sense his silver's gonna have to come in and do something about it because obviously without her th- th- there's nothing but i think she does that because maybe if he comes in she knows he's dead, perhaps. He sees her do this, but so does Jack. And Jack sees the peephole, and he, he gets out his dagger, and he plunges it through the hole. And then by the time he's running the other room, all there is is a bit of perspiration on the dagger, and no sign of anyone. Yeah, and Jack comes back in and tells Vane she's telling the truth. And Vane, he's still, he's just, yeah, he's not impressed with any of it. Yeah, so Vane warns Jack. Um, I th- Yeah, he's warning to Jack. If you're wrong, you'll have to answer to the crew. And to Max, he says, if you're wrong, you'll answer to me. And he leaves. Jack's just like very flustered. And Max is kind of like, oh, looking worse for wear. And Jack just doesn't know what to do. So he's like, yes, all right. (laughs) Oh, yeah, I love Jack. Yeah, it's a funny little Jack moment. Right, so now we're back with Eleanor and Flynn in her office. He's just told all about the Urka. And she's just kind of a sceptical about it all as her father was, really. Says it's a floating castle. You'll never be able to do it. And Flint says, let him worry about that. It's after that he'll need her help. And Eleanor kind of says, why would you come back and not just run with the money? Why would you come back here? And he says it can't be outrun. And then, yeah, he lays it all out about fortifying Nassau and making her stronger. This is a really important scene with hindsight. It doesn't seem much when you're watching it on first watch. It's just kind of like, all right, well, he's got these plans and stuff. But when you're watching it on the rewatch, wow, it's it's quite a powerful scene. The way the music's playing, and it's kind of, he's, he's thinking about Thomas, isn't he? You can work out from this moment. And this is Thomas' vision. It's still very much there that he's laying out. Obviously, we'll get more to that further but we all know yeah you know and he goes through this and scott kind of laughs it off yeah again considering he's kind of already done this what flint's talking about he has kind of made his own kind of paradise i guess in a sense it is more kind of hideout paradise the maroon island but um he's done it it's possible but yeah i've already gone over my moans with kind of scott not being the same scott that comes up in free yeah and uh, you know Eleanor says well 
you know, she sort of makes the argument, you can't, these are pirates, you can't, they're not going to want to be farmers and do all this kind of stuff you're talking about. And Flint says the men aren't animals, they're just starved of hope. Give them that, who's to say what could happen to them? This just this great scene continues where he talks about Odysseus. Odysseus. I'm afraid, I'm afraid my kind of mythology is a bit. Uh. I mean, he tells the oar story, you know. Yeah, about about this guy that meets that sees a ghost. Goes into it a bit, but he's basically it. The gist is he's told to keep walking inland until someone mistakes the oar for a shovel, for that would be the place no man has ever been troubled by the sea, and that's where he'd find peace. And Flint says that's all he wants. Knowing this show, there's going to be some, like, mythological kind of parallels there. I know that. But I'm afraid they kind of go over my head. Um, all that sort of stuff. All that theological kind of stuff. But obviously the gist of what he's saying is there. He, yeah, he's done. He wants to retire. Flint, yeah, Flint's now starting to get interesting. Flint is definitely, he's still very much... A big question over him I kind of still trying to think back to when I first watched and my thoughts were Flint I was always kind of confused with him and yeah you know every time we learn something new about Flint we, we're kind of always left with more questions again this watching first time this is a scene that kind of just it passes by and you don't really think much about it you're like all right so he's he, he doesn't want to do this forever and he is tired you know we got he was desperate in the first episode he was hanging on to this captaincy and his crew and now in this episode we see yeah he's tired and but there's obviously something and we kind of know now what he wants but yeah we still don't know why at this point gates comes in and eleanor learns about the schedule and that they're after it and then she also learns that max is the go-between and yeah that's a really great scene you know flint flint has talked eleanor completely into his vision but therefore now her and max fate is kind of sealed um unfortunately because he's just talked her into it so much and she likes the sound of this kind of peaceful civilized civilized but well run kind of nassau yeah we briefly meet noonan he's he's your typical he's the kind of man that you expect to be running a seedy little brothel he fits the part well Eleanor tells Max, oh yeah, this is just Max and Eleanor, I think. Eleanor tells Max she needs her to hand over the schedule. Says the money can give them a future here. And she can protect her from Vane. And yeah, and this is where I start getting a bit confused with Max this episode. Max wants Eleanor to leave with her. And it, and I get it, like I understand why. And I understand why she wants out. And with this money, she can get out. But it's all very sudden and it's all very... This is what it has to be. There's no reasoning with Max. And yeah, and Eleanor says she, she can't leave. She can't. There's, she's got things she wants to do. She can't. This is her island. This, she's running things. You know, it's, it's very kind of uh, quite unpractical. And it just shows, I think, that they clearly don't know each other as well as they think at this point. You know, it's, it's never really made clear how long they've been. They've had their thing. I don't think it's been much of a emotional thing at this point by the looks of it yeah max says she will never leave her and she loves her and i believe max i i believe max is generally heartbroken in this moment again even though i'm a bit like maybe there could have been a bit of leeway with max and she could have listened to reason a bit and understood why she should at least play the game a bit and stick around but i don't know maybe Vane absolutely scared the bejesus out of her and she just wanted out and to get away from the island and again it's a little bit rash but anyway yeah so gates knocks and max realize you know she's already told them to come up and didn't even want to hear what she had to say and i think this is where it all starts max realizes uh oh, it's we're not on the same page here are we uh, on the same page yeah we're not we're at different different levels with this thing once more she has one more kind of Last attempt, she gets on her knees and says, please leave with her. Please, Eleanor, please leave with me. And Eleanor just doesn't answer. And um, she beckons in Gates, Billy and Flint to enter. They're very different to Vane, these three. So, you know, no one's straight on Max <coughs> straight away. Um, I think it's Gates that says this doesn't have to go badly. And Max just 
she I thought she can't even look at Eleanor and she says she wants to hear she wants to hear her say it she wants to hear that she will sit there and watch while they beat the answer out of her it's a tough predicament for them both I do think that you know I'm not gonna completely go in on Eleanor with this I I understand why completely why she can't go and wouldn't want to just up and go right here right now again very kind of odd and unreasonable for Max to ask that of her but it's on the other flip yeah there's clearly a lot of love on Max's part and she feels the betrayal and and now Eleanor has got this thing in her mind there's no leeway now for her so it's it's doomed isn't it it's doomed Max just yeah Max tells them where they're meeting and she just breaks down you know the guys leave Eleanor tries to like let's talk let's have just talk about what's just happened and Max just doesn't want any of it get out get the fuck out and poor girl she has a right breakdown yeah a, a tough scene a tough scene and one again yeah I do struggle to to kind of not to understand where Max is coming from I know it comes from love and I know she's not in a good place where she's working but considering the fact she did talk earlier you know Oh yeah, we could we could run the inn together, couldn't we? We could. It goes for it bubbles very quick, and I think it was quite an easy. It was quite. It, it was obviously a scene they wanted to do to to split this relationship, get this relationship finished. Feels maybe a little bit of a, like I mentioned in the last episode, a little bit of a thin in the quota kind of thing. Obviously, they will absolutely tidy up all their queer kind of storylines and stuff by the next season. But a little bit of a messy kind of uh, breakup. But you can get away with it. It's not awful. It's not like, oh, this is terrible writing or whatever. Okay, so yeah, that's all I'll say about all that. Um, about their kind of relationship and how all that all ends. Again, I'm thankful for season four when we do get a nice bit of closure for this. A bit of a messy kind of, let's just do it. We need, we need them to break up kind of storyline it'll actually get better writing and better scenes with them in the f in future seasons right so yeah now we have the showdown at the wreck so yeah there's a few little bits going on both parties both crews are after silver Vane is still absolutely pissed off so silver sends out a, a messenger guy yeah the wrecks you know they're, they're pretty much what what they described they're wrecks they you know the shipwrecks and they're it's where the kind of absolute destitute the um, they're on opium and all this sort of stuff they're not even bad guys they're just desperate kind of people I guess on the outskirts that's where they all hang yeah Vane's still pissed off he kills the messenger that Silver sends out obviously to see that if it was him that came out himself would he get a knife and yeah he kind of works out there's a good chance that neither party are going to let him live so yeah there's a bit of cat and mouse with them all over the island you know a bit yeah after a little bit he finds a little space where he sits on a little campfire and he just reads the page he reads it and he's going we're like what's he doing uh who's it the catch i think it's flint catches up with him and you know he's like where's the page where's the schedule and silver's like he's in here um yeah he has burnt the page and he has memorized everything Oh yeah, and there's another little moment. Jack thinks he's found him. He thinks he's found him in his cloak. Um, it's a bit of a you know double bluff for us, the audience as well. We're like, oh god, he's found him, and he turns around and yeah, it's one of these, I guess like opium, you know, addicted guys, just emaciated, and it scares the crap out of Jack, and he loses his stumbling a bit, and he falls arse over tit into the water and drops all the pearls. Yeesh. So yeah, it's an absolute power move, power move from Silver. And we get a little scene with Max. She's packing now. You know, Adele's in there with her. She says, you don't have to run from Vane. We've got, we've got men watching you. And Eleanor's got men downstairs watching for you. Um, you're safe here. This is probably the safest place for you. But Max says she cannot stay. So yeah, she is. she's heartbroken. Whatever happens, she wants out. Gonna be a bit of a bad run now for um, Max. Yeah, Adele again, or another little mention. She's already a real one, you know. She she agrees to help her get away, so she does a bit of distracting one of the lookouts. But yeah, as soon as Max kind of starts down the stairs, she's peeped by someone. <laughs> uh, yeah, someone else is unfortunately there with eyes on Max. 
So Gates and Flint bring Silver back to Eleanor's and she asks, why is he still alive? And yes, confirming 100% that Silver did the right thing. He used his smarts. So neither party, neither party would have let him live through that. Whoever found him, yeah, they, he wasn't getting out of that. He wasn't getting his money. Eleanor agrees to let him stash there for the night and poor Billy has to watch him. <laughs> yeah, Scott, he's still not into the plan. You know, we get another little moment with them um, and Flint's vision. But Eleanor says she needs to do it. So he sort of reluctantly agrees. And then, yeah, final little scene. Um, we get a lovely shot of um, Flint riding on a horse. You know, he's got his thing up his what do you call it face mask i guess whatever you want to call it yeah we briefly meet miranda but we're not going to meet her we're just going to see we're going to see he's got a home he has got somewhere where he can come in kick his boots off pretty literally and he kind of just collapses on the floor and we see this kind of well-to-do woman she's playing i don't know what it is and yeah and he just collapses he's knackered he's it's the first time i think he's obviously comfortable and can put take the mask off pretty much in both ways uh, metaphorically as well and just kind of oh it's been a day love <laughs> pretty much um but we of course will get more into miranda and all that uh, later episodes <laughs> last item so yeah a strong episode the story continues well in this episode the escapades of john silver and the stolen schedule developed further to a tense conclusion at the Rex, with Silver coming out on top to secure his own survival. We delve a bit deeper into the minds of our two captains. Flint has a dream and a vision of a quiet retirement. He just has to raise a little hell to get it. While Vane is still in his pirating prime, but things are just not going his way this episode. We learn a bit more of his and Eleanor's relationship and that things aren't that great at the moment. Max and Eleanor's short-lived relationship is cut short. As discussed, I don't love the way this all comes about and I am grateful again that there is that bit of closure in season four for them. I just don't think Max's reasonings are made quite clear enough at this point and is a bit out of character for someone who is usually the smartest person in the room. I also discuss my slight issues with Mr. Scott at this point in the story, but it's only a moan with full hindsight of what's to come. Again, otherwise he just comes across as a concerned advisor at this point and it makes perfect sense. Although a solid enough episode that keeps things moving, it is in contention for my least favourite probably. Fine on a rewatch, you know, when you're binge watching, and on a first watch, but a bit of a plod along when you're fine tooth combing it like I am doing for these episodes, for these in-depth reviews. That being said, it's still going to be a respectable 7.6 out of 10 score. Okay, so now we come to the fun part of awarding an MVP of the episode. Who stood out? Who was doing bits? You know, who was making moves? So Jack is definitely in contention. Continuing from his business with Singleton, He's making plans, you know, he's securing business for his captain, he's working things out, what what things have really gone down. But he does kind of boo-boo at the end of the episode and just drop all the pearls and lose all the pearls in the sea. And Silver sort of has the reverse journey in that he has a shaky start and in result he also plunges into the water. But then once he's up he kind of thinks smart and lands. It's a bit frantic and desperate for a little while. But once he's at the Rex, he kind of rightfully works out what's going to happen. And, you know, he is not going to make out, make it out alive. So he thinks fast and he thinks smart and he memorizes the page and then he burns all the evidence. It's an absolute power move. Silver's going to get MVP for me this episode. OK, so my favorite scene and quote, while, um, yeah, tits, tits, fruit, fruit is just an absolute classic and you know, worthy of a strong honourable mention. I think I have to once more tie in the best scene and quote again with that great scene I talked about in quite a lot of detail with Flint explaining to Eleanor his vision uh, of Nassau and just how, you know, specifically quote-wise about the ore and all that sort of stuff. I won't go over it all again. And, you know, it's fantastic writing, that whole scene. And basically, it's, yeah, it's a great scene to rewatch. It's a great rewatch scene for foreshadowing and for learning of things to come. And, yeah, and it's him 
also passing now this this vision of his, this dream of his and Thomas now onto Eleanor and, you know, making it now her vision and her dream. And again, it kind of a bit of sh- sad foreshadowing for her because it will never quite be that for her. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, it's a really powerful scene with hindsight and it is one of my favourites. So, yes, that was episode three. I did a lot of waffling and kind of tangenting and probably repeating myself on this one. It's going to I'm going to have to tidy this one up a little bit. But yeah, it's a solid episode and I'm excited to continue this journey. All right. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you, crew. And I will catch you next time on the Bonnie Rackham for another Black Cells episode review. All right. Peace out. Bye.